This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today, we have a very special guest on the show, Changpeng Sao, who is the CEO of Binance. So many of our uh, viewers and listeners probably have traded on Binance, which is a crypto-to-crypto exchange. And we'll talk to uh, CZ, as he's called, about his story in founding Binance, how it grew, and the challenges and opportunities for the future. CZ, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Very uh, pleasure to be here. So, yeah, uh, tell us a bit about how you got to be involved in the blockchain space and how you entered this space. Sure. Um, I think that goes back to uh, mid-2013. Um, a friend of mine, his name is Ron Tao, um, he asked me to look into Bitcoin and said it was kind of interesting. And um, he also asked me to look into Ripple at the same time. So um, he's the institutional investor into uh, B- uh, BTC China, one of the oldest exchanges that actually recently stopped uh, uh, operations. So that's when I, uh, that's how I got into this. Uh, that's how I got exposed to the uh, uh, Bitcoin industry back then. Uh, that's what it's called. Um, and uh, even back then, I was uh, kind of interested to to do a first idea was of course um, for mo- for many people was to do an exchange. Um, and I think back then it was like Mongox. I think Trade Hill probably just stopped. Um, so it was a bunch of very uh, early, uh, sort of very, very early exchanges. Um, and uh, But somehow I joined blockchain.info because I bumped into uh, 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 Roger Vera at the time. So uh, that's kind of the early start. And then, uh, so that's kind of how I got, how I got into the, this industry. And so what was that like working at blockchain.info? What was your role there and what were kind of the things you learned about this industry from that experience? Sure. Actually, there's some really valuable uh, experiences from that uh, uh, experience. So I was the third person in. There was Ben Reeves, who's the founder. There was Nicholas Carey, who was who was the CEO. And then there was myself. So I was the third person in. Um, ben Reeves is a very smart guy, and he but he's a young kid that just want to focus on technology. He he he's not a very social guy. He doesn't want to talk. He doesn't like to talk too much. Um, and uh, uh, blockchain.info back in those days has some very interesting properties. Um, it's a decentralized team. So when we had about eighteen people, they were spread out in like I don't I forgot like a, a dozen countries. Um, they don't have an office at back then. Uh, they also don't have a bank account. So everything was done in crypto in 2013. So that's kind of a, a <clears throat> so everything was done in Bitcoin back then, basically. Um, uh, I think Ethereum w- wasn't even started. So um, uh, so that, that, that was probably one of the very unique companies back then. And it kind of gave a very interesting exposure to be a pure crypto company, a company with no bank account, no offices, fully uh, or, re- or relatively decentralized. So uh, we actually have adopted some of those philosophies into Binance even today. So, I, I mean, this is definitely one of the topics I, I want to speak a, a lot about, uh, like how Binance is run. But when you think back to blockchain.info, how well did this work, this you know decentralized company and crypto only? And the, what, what were some of the pros and cons of that? Sure. I mean, basically... In a decentralized uh, fashion, there are, especially when the team's decentralized, there are some disadvantages and there's some advantages. Uh, the advantages, people can, you can hire people from all over the world. You're not limited to your own talent pool. Uh, but there's some very interesting disadvantages. Everybody's in a different time zone. Just trying to get a meeting together takes a, takes a, like, takes a few emails back and forth. And then uh, um, um, usually take a day to organize a meeting because people are spread around all different kind of time zones. So the efficiency actually does go down. And especially if you have to make decisions, discussions, or uh, uh, stuff like that, it's a little bit difficult. Um, and there are ways to overcome it. Basically, you gotta, you gotta have, uh, you got to empower the people. So each individual can make a relatively large number of decisions, and they can, um, they can be siloed off. So there are different trade-offs and different ways to sort of run this kind of an operation. Um, and um, 
you also need guys who are like very proact, who are self motivators, who are very proactive. So you you want to find guys who are really into, who really like what they do, who are really into doing the stuff. So they don't need to be asked what to do. They don't need to be told what to do. They they will just find stuff to do on their own. So um, there are there are some there's a, there's there's a lot of challenges. So it's not a very simple, straightforward thing. So do you feel that worked well at Blockchain or Info? Um, to be honest, I think at blockchain.info, uh, at the beginning, when we had a smaller team, it worked quite well. But when the team got larger, I don't think it worked that well. Um, so um, I think basically uh, when the team got larger, if you don't get a, a, a if you, when a team is small, when the early funding teams are all, uh, uh, are all very hardcore crypto guys, so they, they share the vision. They understand the vision. They kind of work very hard uh, around it. But when you get a larger, when the team become larger, it's kind of hard to make. Um, uh, well, I, I shouldn't really comment, but I think so in the last couple of years, blockchain. I didn't really follow blockchain.info very closely, but I think the speed of progress is a little bit slower than I expected, to be honest. So what, what was the decision for you to leave blockchain.info? How did you make that decision? How did you know it was the right time? Well, actually, so for me, it was, so I was, I've always been working on trading systems, mostly like trading systems for brokers, for exchanges, for, so I've been, uh, I spent like the, I've been working for about 18 to 20 years now. Um, so I've always on the, I've always been on the trading side and um, blockchain.info is a block explorer plus a wallet. And um, uh, it wasn't, a re it wasn't really where my specialty is. I mean, the technology is okay. And so in 2014, um, uh, my current business partner, she joined uh, OKCoin first, and then she, she recruited me. In, she said, hey, do you want to work on an exchange? And um, so I joined OKCoin as, the, as, 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 the, as their third um, co-founder. So that's how I uh, left uh, blockchain.info. So your experience is on the technology side to build uh, technologies for exchanges at Bloomberg, Fusion Trading. It's it's always been on that side, on the technology side. Yeah, yeah. So uh, even when I was an intern, I worked at a company in Tokyo uh, who got like basically who are working on trading systems related to the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Um, so even in the early, even before I graduated, I was interning. Uh, I was a, I was writing software, uh, mostly C, C++ code, um, for trading systems for uh, in the Tokyo market. So and then when I graduated, I took the same job, went back to the same company, and then later on, I went to Bloomberg in New York. Um, I was in charge of the Bloomberg Tradebook Futures um, uh, development team. So I was managing a relatively sizable development uh, team for f trade book fu uh, for futures trading systems, and uh, um, so I've always been well, working on the trading side of things. And I've always be uh, I I was a developer. I was writing code, and then le uh, later on moved uh, into management. Of, I guess um, uh, in Bloomberg, and then I went in two thousand in two thousand five. I went back to Shanghai to start my own company with a couple other guys. And we were doing trading systems for brokers as well. So I've always been in this kind of field. So it took 20 years, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so then you were at OKCoin uh, and you were CTO there. And um, and then you 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 worked for OKCoin for around a year and you then left um, on, on some differences. So tell us about that experience. Um, so... Uh, one of the key differences, um, I, I think I can explain that a little bit better now, which is um, um, in a place where there's uh, very, when regulations change very quickly, um, and there's like very, basically very high degrees of regulatory uncertainty, um, people are relatively short-sighted. They would just want to make quick money. Um, basically, if you have a 10-year plan and the regulation changes every three to six months, and there's, there's a high degree of uncertainty, that 10 year plan usually doesn't work very well. Um, yeah, so uh, people are forced to have a short to have a shorter term vision. When you go more and more short term vision, people are more uh, into short term gains and they get into sort of questionable gray areas. And that's not that's kind of different from the value uh, uh, view or, or my or the values that I've been brought up to uh, from the international from more of an international exposure. So I didn't agree with a lot of the value, a lot of the ways the values are generated in there. So um, I left 
uh, I didn't get uh, there's uh, there's a lot of decisions I didn't really agree with. Um, I won't get into the details, but I just said, look, this is not really for me, and I left. Yeah, I remember at the time reading about your departure because there was a lot of discussion around it. I think was there also a hack at that uh, around then? Right, I remember there was something where there was a lot of discussion around OK Coin, and then kind of your departure as well came. Uh, so the discussion came three months afterwards um, over a contract between Roger Veer and um, uh, OKCoin. OK it's a contract that I facilitated when I was at OKCoin. OK but basically, when I left, the contract was reviewed by both parties and was fine. And three months later, it came out of nowhere saying um, a, bunch of, a bunch of debates. And um, so uh, it is what it is. <laughs> So after OKCoin, okay you started your own company, right? And the company, as, a, as far as I understand it, was to focusing on building exchange technology. So can you, can you walk us through, like, what was the decision making or the thinking behind starting that company and how did it turn out? Sure. So um, uh, that company is called uh, BJ Tech. Um, and uh, so in 2000, that's early 2015. Um, and um, I thought about building an exchange again. And uh, in, to be honest, we fir I first thought about building a Bitcoin exchange, like a fiat to Bitcoin exchange. That's what most exchanges are back then. Um, and um, I looked around, I was missing, uh, I, ha I had a couple of tech guys who actually pinned me and wanted to do something together. And so we had a tech team, a very small team, like a three people team at, back then. Um, but then we were missing the marketing and operations and customer support side of things. And um, when we were building it, it was like, well, it's kind of it's going to be quite hard for us to build this exchange, uh, just uh, only having a tech uh, tech uh, uh, strength. So, and uh, when we were talking with a couple other guys who were, or who other, a couple other people who are either already have exchanges or who are planning to build exchanges, and they said, well, hey, Champagne, why don't you just build a technology platform and we'll buy it from you? And so that's, that gave me an idea. I said, uh, hey, I, we could sell the platform as a, uh, uh, just as a, as a technology platform. So we kind of morphed the business into that only within a couple of months. And um, we were selling uh, systems. And then um, something happened in July 2017 where there was a lot of uh, uh, other what we call cultures exchanges in China that basically trade stamps, um, art antiques, and all this other crazy stuff. And they had a very archaic system, very slow. And they said, "Hey, Champion, you have this really fast system. Can we, uh, can we, can you use, can you adapt your system to our needs?" Well, I said, "Fine, that's kind of what we do." And we adapted that. So, uh, and so in China, there was like they at peak, there was about two thousand of those type of exchanges. So over the next two years, we sold about thirty copies of our exchange system, and it's always provided as a, a platform as a service. So people pay a monthly fee and they, they, they get an exchange system and we provide the back end, the front end, uh, uh, the mobile apps, everything. So uh, we, we did that for two years, had 30 clients. And uh, so that's the exchange system we built, uh, uh, we built from scratch. But when we built it, we wanted that system to, to, that system to be very high performance. So everything was engineered. Everything is engineered not like a script from a, like the first cut of a uh, prototype. It was always, if, it, if it's something that's really advanced, uh, that's really difficult, but can in, improve the performance, we always took the longer uh, route. So um, it took us a good two and a half years to build out that system. We uh, actually stumbled on many problems uh, during that two and a half years. So uh, and then at the end of two and a half years, actually what happened is Chinese, the Chinese government shut down all of those cultures exchanges. So most of the business dried up. Well, we said, well, now uh, we look at Polynet. Polynet was pretty big when uh, early 2017. We said, well, now that, that market is quite big. We could do that. And so, that, so that's how uh, Binance was kind of conceptualized. Wow. So like what must have seemed like a disaster, like the Chinese government changing regulations or turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Uh, that happened to us a few times, actually. So we got lucky in a lot of places. <laughs> okay, so that's that's when like you you hit on the idea of crypto to crypto exchange. Now, like like crypto to crypto exchanges are actually pretty old. Uh, like they've been around since two thousand fourteen, two thousand fifteen, two thousand sixteen. Uh, didn't you feel in two thousand seventeen that it was like too late to start a crypto exchange, crypto to crypto exchange? Uh, so. Um... 
we actually, so in 2013, even back in the blockchain.info, uh, we had discussions about a crypto to crypto exchange. So we said the fiat to crypto is the bridge. And once you're into crypto, you can do crypto to crypto. Um, and uh, so that, that concept was way like was back five years ago. Uh, so we discussed that. Of course, the market wasn't quite there. there uh, most of the else uh, at that time wasn't really worth trading. Um, so there was really only Bitcoin. Um, uh, I guess repo was there. People were, were using it. Uh, it but um, so in 2015, we actually looked at, looked at that as well. And that's when I think Poloniex was just starting and they were quite small. We said, well, the volume's not that big. Um, and in 2017 though, we looked at, we looked at it again. We said, well, the, the, they're, they're making a lot of money. They're making millions of dollars a day, <laughs> which is very impressive. Uh, but uh, we looked at the system. We said, well, we can, we can definitely improve on that. Um, and um, I talked with a couple of other guys, like uh, including Zen Packet, uh, who used to be who used to work at OKCoin, now works for a fund. And he said, "Look, if you guys build another crypto to crypto exchange that's that's fast and that has customer service or decent customer service, uh, we, we, we're gonna we're gonna switch very quickly." So there was a there was a lot of um, um, uh, unsatisfied demand in the market. I think even today, there's probably still unsatisfied demand. I mean, we're not perfect. There's, we have a lot of room to grow. So I think this market is still very new. Um, so it's never too late. Um, you just got to start and push forward. Yeah, it all often looks like that, right? So that, you know, in retrospect, you can say, actually, this was very new. There was still lots of opportunity. But then at the times, you know, you see, okay, there's all these other companies doing it. Maybe I'm too late. But you did, <laughs> you did like, you. Knew, I mean, I guess with your background and having built exchanges, and if you always, if you see that, okay, there's all of those things I can clearly do better. Maybe it was obvious that there was that opportunity there. Yeah, I, well, the way I view things is actually a little bit different. Um, I always think there are more opportunities in the future than there were there have been in the past. Uh, it's just the opportunities may be slightly different. So, um, so we did a few things slightly differently. Um, so, um, uh, it, it is a crypto to crypto exchange, but uh, we made the uh, user experience. Um, there's some. There's a lot of different. There's a lot of small differences. So, for example, we didn't just focus on English, where Polonex and then some of the other established players uh, are only had an English interface. They pretty much only had a PC or web client. So we said, okay, well, we got to do better, right? We're gonna uh, we're gonna have multiple devices. We're gonna have Android apps, iOS apps. We're gonna have native PC client, native Mac client. Uh, we're gonna do multiple languages. So we did ten. Uh, I think right now we have about ten languages. So we're gonna focus on countries that don't speak English or, or, or English is not the main language. So there's a lot of different ways you can play. And um, um, I, uh, at the time, even, even at the time, I was pretty, I was pretty confident there's a, there's, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, so, but, but one thing I would say though, um, I thought it would take us a lot longer to become the world's number one exchange, uh, even when we started. And even only, even like a week before we became the world's number one exchange, I just thought it was going to take another another good six months. Um, so things, some of the things were surprised. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just something to to point out here, right? We haven't really uh, uh, highlighted this, and and some some listeners may be aware of this, but I'm sure many others are not. So Binance as a company, right? So you talked about July 2017, and Binance started. Of course, there was you know some work before that kind of accelerated this, but still, it's less than a year, and in the last quarter. You guys made profit of two hundred million dollars, so the, the quarterly profit of two hundred million dollars in less than a year of operation. I mean, this is absolutely insane in a way. And and I was before the show, I was briefly asking you because I have never heard of a company that so quickly reached such a level of profitability. So it, it seems this may well be you know the fastest company you know in the history of all companies to reach that level of profitability in you know such a short time. And then of course, also in terms of, of company growth, right? I think you're two or 300 employees at this point, or maybe already more uh, in, in such a, you know, less than a year. So it's it just completely insane growth and an insane business that you've built in, in an incredibly short time. Yeah, I think a lot of that is uh, surprising to us as well. Um, I think, but there's a lot of factors contributing to it, though. Um, I think basically, 
um, companies will continue to grow faster and faster uh, because now the technology, the um, internet is there, um, e-commerce is there, so and then crypto is there. Uh, so um, there's a lot of um, uh, things that facilitate. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things other people have built, which have, uh, which um, which ensures much higher freedom and the foundations are much more solid. So companies will continue to become faster and faster. But uh, I think also one of the things we were lucky on is basically we are uh, exchanges is a very special type of business where we we're kind of in the center of value exchange, and um, um, we got uh, we got lucky in a lot of places. I think our product is superior, um, and we have uh, our service is decent, um, and we also our value um, our value proposition or not our proposition, uh, our current value uh, system. So like what we believe in uh, kind of rings very true with the community. So I think that helped us, pe that helped people to understand what we do, why we do it, and they agree with our mission, with our principles. So they agree with why we do it. And so that kind of helped people to uh, be more loyal or more um, uh, to us as well. So there's a, there's, so there's a, there's a combination of different factors um, that helps. Uh, but I think there's a lot of luck too. So I think we just started doing the right thing at the right time, and the market exploded. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. If everything starts over again, I'm not sure if it's going to be the same result. To be honest, <laughs> super interesting. So you 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 mentioned uh, in your previous answer, value system. What is the value system that you focus finance around? Sure. I think basically. Our value is to spread the freedom. So I think basically um, the uh, crypto offers a different level of freedom in terms of investments, exchange, uh, exchange of value, um, and holding different assets. So it's this it's this freedom that we think are very beneficial to the society, and it's spreading this freedom that's our core mission. So. Um, so this is what we focus on, and um, we actually haven't really talked about this a lot in a lot of detail to our users. And um, we have always emphasized in protecting user benefits. So this is something that we don't really say, but we actually do, and people 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 understand it. So people actually, a lot of our users tell us that okay, you, you guys really take our interest in. Uh, uh, you guys you guys really uh, understand how uh, you guys are really working hard to protect us. So I think that kind of mess, that kind of uh, stuff helps. Uh, is very important to build a very strong community. So I think we probably have one of the most loyal uh, and most supportive communities in uh, of any business. So uh, we have guys working. Uh, we have a lot of guys working for us basically for free on, on volunteer basis. Uh, we just give them recognition and we give them access to our team, um, and that's all. And they're. And actually, most of them are financially free, and some some of them are financially free free because of us, because they buy they bought into the Binance coin early on. So we now have like financially free wealthy people working as volunteers, helping our other users. So it's a very unique it's a very unique situation. But I think that's only part. And other people have tried to copy that model, but you can't copy that model unless you have that kind of mission, uh, uh, you know, unless you have that kind of value system. So I think that's kind of unique right now. So you mentioned, right, this focus on spreading freedom and on protecting the users. But you said you guys didn't, you know, actually talk so much about this. But so can, can you give some examples of decisions you made? Where, you know, maybe one could have gone A or one could have taken decision to, you know, in favor of freedom and protecting user benefits, you know, that actually created that culture. Like what were some of the critical decisions that you had to make? To create this, sure. Um, yeah, there's some very clear decisions that it, when I look back. So for, uh, the first one came about two months or a month and a half ish after we went live. So back then, uh, so this is literally. So this is uh, September, early September. Chinese government said uh, any ICO projects should uh, return the funds to uh, the investors to the extent basically possible. They didn't say how you do it, but um, so. Because of the news, the price of most IC coins actually dropped, and so now the investors are actually losing money. And now they, uh, we now got to return the funds to the investors. Most projects don't have well because the coins dropped in price, they actually don't have more money to uh, to make up the, the difference. 
So for the ICOs that we facilitated during that time, we, there was five, uh, five projects. We actually set a, a, as a platform, not, as a, not our own coin, like this is other people's coins. So we said we will cover the differences for, to return that to, to the investors. We calculated how much it would cost us at that time. It's going to cost, it costed us actually about 6 million US dollars in total. And this is back when we were one month and a half old. So we didn't have as much money as we had today. So we, we were, so we looked at our financials. We raised 15 million US, 15, one, five million US dollars in the ICO. We spent quite a bunch of it already. And uh, we now got, we now had, we had, we had, I think we had about, I don't know, um, some, we had some money, we were able to cover it, but it was six million is a big chunk of the, of the savings we had. But we said, okay, no, we got to protect our users. We're going to make up the difference. We will cover the costs. We will cover the differences, even for coins that's not related to our project. So when we did that, the Chinese, well, and this is in, mostly in China back then. So the Chinese community loved us. They were like, they were, everyone was saying we were setting the good standard, the, go, the new standard for uh, how to protect users. And uh, when, the other, when the other exchanges in China got shut down and all the users, guess where they went? They all came to us. So it actually worked out in the long run. Uh, it worked out very well in the long run, but at the time it was a really, really tough decision. Um, and if things continue to go bad, uh, we could be out of business, right? So we didn't know the uh, what, what, how the regulations are gonna play out. So, uh, so that's a very clear example of how some of the difficult decisions uh, have been made, but we always follow our principle. So we have a principle and we make the decisions according to that principle. No, oh, this is amazing. Yeah, and I can imagine that that decision, right? Let's say you raise fifteen million, you spend three years, something like that, and then you give fifty percent of your money, you know, because okay, this is you feel like the right way. And obviously, at that point, if it goes wrong, you also have the people who invested in your token sale and your ICO, right? They would then also suffer. So that's yeah, very impressive, and I I can see that would be a very powerful decision to also establish that culture and community. Yeah. And also, uh, so today we make a lot of those kind of decisions without my involvement anymore. So once you have the mission and value system established, now the team knows what to, what decisions, how to make decisions. So they just make decisions on their own according to those kind of values. So a lot of times if uh, um, this kind of decisions, they just make it on their own. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. So you did an ICO to fund Binance and you raised 15 million. So presumably in this episode, you yourself would have been required to return that 15 million back to your original investors. So how were you able to spend 6 million when you yourself were returning 15? So... Uh, so that's another lucky break we had. Uh, by September, uh, by, by, so a, a month and a half later, uh, by septem early September, uh, our coin actually went up 10x already. So uh, we sold half of our coins and we still had, we still had half of uh, 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 like 40% of our coins. And the coins we had actually, and we also collected uh, trading fees in our own coin, in the Binance coin. Um, and the coins we collected and the coins we had, which we, we actually ended up never touching, went up 10x. So now instead of the 15 million uh, we raised, and in theory, the 15 million we had in sort of our own coins, uh, roughly, um, the 50 million in Binance coins we had is now worth 100, 150 million. So uh, it wasn't completely that we were, okay, but, the, but the, the, uh, we decided to lock like 
uh, all all 80 million of our coins. So we decided to lock basically 100 percent of our coins. We didn't really touch it. Uh, so uh, we had some leeway, um, but we were it was a bit easier because the Binance pri Binance coin price already went up 10x. So oh, so what happened was that uh, the Chinese said, okay, you have to return the money, and then so people had the coin and they got back the money. At least the Chinese people that they spent on the coin. Is that correct? Uh, well, no, they have to return the uh, tokens that they bought with, and uh, then the project team is supposed to return the BTC or ETH that they they uh, they, they they purchased with. They purchased with. Okay, so basically the Chinese said, okay, every project that did an ICO, they have to give the, the choice to the people that they can either keep the coin or they can return the coin and get their original money back. Is was that what happened? Uh, well, that's. I think the Chinese government didn't say there was a choice. The Chinese government wanted to say everybody have to return everything, but then um, a lot of for the coins that went up in value, nobody actually wanted to give it back, right? And you can't force users. Uh, you can't force individuals that way. You can force platforms and project teams because they're kind of uh, well more identified entities. Uh, but uh, for example, the Binance coin it went up 10x in value. Nobody really wanted to return it. And if they did, uh, we said, fine, we'll just buy it back at market value, which is fine for us. Um, so, uh, but mo uh, uh, the government forced uh, the projects and the, uh, the, the exchanges, but they, they couldn't force the individuals. Super interesting. So of course, like this, this sort of brings back the question of why did you go for an ICO in the first place? Why not venture capital? So when we first, so in, uh, I think we, we kind of conceptualized Binance in the end of May in 2017, um, early June. Um, so when I, so at that time, um, the first person I actually, the first outside person I actually talked to is Da Hongfei, the founder of Neo. Um, he's a very good friend of mine, been my good friend for like a few years. Um, and we were all early blockchainers in the sort of Chinese community scene. So we've known each other for quite a few years. So he was actually the, so I said, I said, so he's the first guy I spoke to, and they said, "Look, uh, uh, Fei, I'm gonna, I'm thinking about doing this exchange, uh, a crypto to crypto exchange." I think that's pretty much all I said, and he said, "Okay, um, I want to invest." And um, so he he was the very first investor in our organization, in Binance, and um, so he, uh, so at the time he we were thinking about going to going through the VC route, but then um, at uh, at that. Uh, early June, I saw another project doing an ICO in China, and I know the founder quite well. And uh, he raised fifteen million dollars like, in ten days. And then mid June, I went to uh, I went to a potluck dinner organized by one by Chandler Guo uh, in Chongqing in China. And um, every everybody there is talking about an ICO. Every, everybody there said, C, uh, "CZ, you gotta do an, you should do an ICO instead of doing VC funding." And uh, when I saw the the other ICO done in early June, uh, in ten days, I know the founder really well. I thought to myself, "Wait a second! If this guy, if this team can raise fifteen million dollars in this period of time, I'm relatively confident I could as well. I mean, from a reputation, from an execution, um, from all just from all around, I think I'm no worse uh, than that team." <laughs> so <laughs> I said, "Okay, let's try it." So we started, and then you worked out. Would you say it was a relatively easy ICO for you to do and easy to raise the, the 15 million? So um, our ICO process was, uh, looking back, was all relatively smooth, to be honest. But I wouldn't say it's easy. Um, it was one of the most demanding uh, uh, two weeks of uh, my career, I think. Um, so just to give you an idea, um, I lost about six kilos in that two weeks. <laughs> so that's just my body weight. Um, so I didn't, I, did, I didn't sleep at all. Uh, I, uh, and um, so what happened is basically on June 14th, on the, on the Paul Lock dinner, everyone's like, okay, CZ, you got to do an ICO. I said, fine, we're going to do an ICO. So after that dinner, I made a call to my team who, uh, who, who's, uh, who's in a different location. Um, and I just said, okay, we're going to do an ICO and let's start writing the white paper now. And we need both Chinese and English versions. And it was, I think that was about 11 p.m. Um, and um, um, and we kind of continued until like 4 p.m. 4 a.m. And uh, as and then we continued the next day for the next two or three days. We were just writing this thing, and we were writing the English and Chinese version at the same time. By Ju by June 17th, so three days later, we had both versions ready, 
and without the advisor section. So, and then um, I started emailing that version out to all my initial advisors. I think I got about 20 of them um, uh, in about 24 hours. Um, they, they basically all said, fine, I'll, I'll be your advisor. Um, and then we started doing our ICO and we did five sessions. Each session lasted about 10 to 15 minutes. So in total, uh, we spent, in terms of the fundraising time, it took us about uh, really literally a, a six, uh, an hour-ish in total time to raise about 15 million, but it was spread out over two weeks. But we wanted to raise most of the money on our own platform. So we actually, pro uh, we programmed that platform. We, uh, we, we measure people uh, who register our platform first will get the ICO allocations. So we did a lot of programming. We did, we did the initial site with a user database and everything else during that two weeks. And we actually had a, had a couple of hiccups as well. Um, and uh, originally I thought about doing a around the world tour, like going to San Francisco, New York to, to, to do like uh, road shows, um, going to Shanghai, Shenzhen, Tokyo. Uh, we ended up not doing a single roadshow, so we stayed in the off. I stayed in the office the whole time. Uh, so instead, we did a few like uh, live streams. Um, so we 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 just used the internet basically. Um, so we didn't really sleep much, and there was a lot of there was just so much stuff to cover. Uh, we had we started with a so we had a team of of about thirty people, not for like thirty five, thirty six people. Um, so we used that team to do to do this thing, but then uh, there were so many questions uh, from users. Uh, we created, I think, we created about ten WeChat groups, each group holding about only five hundred people in about uh, three days, and there was just like so there was just so much just, just, there was just so much going on. So that was a uh, from a demand from a workload demand perspective. I think that's the uh, that's one of the toughest periods in terms of workload. Uh, there was just so much going on in that two weeks. But the good thing is, in two weeks, you raise fifteen million, you're done, and uh, so you, you, well, at least you're not worried, you're not too worried about money anymore. So it's a very intense experience. But I think um, for any serious entrepreneur who is serious about that project, that experience is definitely worth it. So you basically went from potluck dinner, people talking about ICO, and you're like, okay, I want to do that. And then was that do that the next day or the same day? And then three days of white paper writing and then and then the ICO? Or like, and so the, the time from dinner to to ICO actually running was how long? So I got I got back to the hotel about 11 p.m. And I called the team saying, we're going to do that. We're going to do the ICO. And to be honest, some of the team members said, what's the ICO? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and actually, so before this, before I own ICO, I've never participated in an ICO. I've never done one. I've never ad advised one. I've never, I've never bought uh, ICO coins before. So to me, like it was new, but I kind of, I at least kind of knew what ICO is, but to some of the team members, like uh, who said, okay, uh, please write the, uh, please contribute to the white paper. They said, what's the ICO? So well, better read about it quickly. So, um, uh, so, but we got started on the we got we got started on the same night, um, and we just worked until uh, un, until morning. And so three days three days later, after about seven iterations of the uh, seven major iterations of the white paper, we kind of uh, we were we were happy with both the English and Chinese version. So uh, and then um, uh, so that was so the potluck dinner was on July on June fourteenth, and we finished the ICO on July second. So that that's the whole process from the from the from the minute we decided to do it to like having 15 million uh, US dollars equivalent of crypto in our in our wallets. And there's actually a couple of guys who uh, who are very influential in that decision making. So I met Chris, Mon the uh, the founder of Monaco, um, uh, in on the potluck dinner on June 14th in Chengdu in China. I didn't I did not know him before then. So that's the first time meeting him. He said, um, he's doing, he, he was in the middle of his ICO. He's already raised about 15 million US dollars. And I think his target was 20. And uh, he said, look, you, it, from his decision to execution, uh, it was 10 days. So he said, you can definitely do it in 10 days. I was like, seriously? So that was in like evening, uh, that was like afternoon, evening on June 14th, 2017. So, um, and then he said, no, seriously, you can do it. And I talked to a bunch of other people. They all said, you can do it. I said, okay, let's, let's do it. 
<laughs> so, and I think this is a little bit of the answer to like, how did you manage to grow a company, you know, within like less than a year from nothing to, you know, 200 million revenues, hundreds of employees is like that speed of execution and decision making is just absolutely insane and extremely impressive to like, you know, so quickly make that decision, move quickly, no time lost on, on anything. So yeah, ha hats off. That's, that's really, that's something, right? Yeah. So uh, I can elaborate on that a little bit, uh, if you're interested, basically. So, um, uh, one of the things that I think is very critical is, um, we really don't, sp don't waste a lot of time on decision making. We spend most of our time on execution. So one of the unique uh, structures in our team is uh, people do give me a lot of respect. Um, and so um, you basically, usually when I make a decision, people just execute. So, and they're very strong in execution. So they get things done and they execution so much faster than uh, usually when they say I am done with something, uh, it's usually before I think they could be done with it. So they, they usually, uh, they're, they're very strong on the execution side of things. Um, so we have a very simple decision-making process and we don't really dwell on it. And once we decide, we just execute. Uh, so that has always been all the, the, the Binance model. The other thing that's very important is um, there are a lot of times when we are not exactly sure uh, what to, well, whether something we do will be beneficial or not, but we would experiment, we would just do it. And, uh, and then, some, and then some, uh, a lot of times good, good things happen. So I'll give you another example. For example, when um, uh, Malta is a country I'm actually not too familiar with before, uh, but we heard good things about about that, and it's quite far away from Asia. So, but people recommended I fly there and meet a bunch of guys and find find things out. Uh, but to me, it was like far away. Things are unclear. I don't really know anybody there. But I flew there to meet the guys and to find out, and that turned to be a that turned out to be a really good decision that helped us like literally a, a month later. So there's a lot of those kind of things where you just, you just have to execute. So that's kind of what we do. You mentioned you guys use a very simple decision-making process. What's that decision-making process? So basically, uh, I tell people, I tell all, all my team, if you're very comfortable with the decision you have to make, if you, if you're relatively confident about that decision, uh, then just make it and just execute. If you're not, if you're not, if you're not too confident about that decision, then ask two or three people uh, beside you, whoever, whoever that is. It might be your colleagues, it might be your boss, it might be your uh, subordinate. That's, uh, it doesn't matter. And if you're really not sure, then ask me. Um, and uh, um, uh, I have a decision-making philosophy that I, if I make like 80% good decisions, it's usually okay. Um, as long as, as long as the 20% decisions are not fatal, major decisions. So when I make major decisions, I usually consult somebody. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, we also avoid, uh, large team decisions. So I, I specifically say, look, if you, if you, if your decision process involves more than like four people, that's usually a, that's usually a not good, uh, that's usually not a good, uh, way to make decisions. Uh, you feel like we never have like 10, 20 people in your room trying to make decisions. That usually, that's usually bad. It wastes a lot of time uh, and you make decisions that are usually compromises. So uh, we are very, so we keep our decisions process very simple. Um, and uh, sometimes, hey, look, if you make a, if we make a not so good decision, we kind of go sideways and we, all we got to do is make sure that we come back to our main trunk uh, quickly enough. So that's kind of what we do. So now, uh, like going back to, to this ICO, um, Binance actually took a very unique model with the, with the ICO because in some senses at that point, you were building a centralized exchange and, um, and generally we tend to think that coins fit decentralized networks better than, you know, centralized exchange businesses. So you bridge the gap using a special model. So tell us what, what the model for the Binance network token is. So I think Binance, uh, the Binance coin is one of the first to one of the first tokens th that I know of, uh, that's used for a centralized business. And, um, um, and it's used in such a way that we, it's not so much a blockchain business. Uh, well, it's not, it's not, it's, our token is just an ERC 20 token so far. And um, it's used, it has benefits tied to our project. 
Um, and actually, initially, some of our some of the uh, people that I consulted say you you probably cannot do an ICO on this because you're not doing a blockchain. Strictly, it's not a blockchain project. Uh, you're building a centralized exchange, which is uh, different. I kind of ignored that. I said, look, if you have a digital uh, blockchain token that uh, people can trust, and uh, if it's associate, if it has association with your uh, project, and if your project does well, and this token will rise in value, I think that model will work. So we tie the token with utility on our platform. So basically, um, if you hold the token and if, when you use the token to pay for, uh, uh, to, when you trade on our platform, we, we can deduct the trading fees from your token reserve and you'll get a 50% discount. So uh, we, we, we adopted that early model. And later on, when we, build a, when we actually build a decentralized exchange, like a blockchain-based exchange, and we can convert that token onto the native token on that uh, uh, blockchain. So we did that, and uh, it was a relatively novel idea at the time. But I, to me, the economics makes total sense. Um, some people got it right away. Some people asked a lot of questions, but I think so far it kind of worked out pretty well. And now a lot of now a lot of people are copying our model, which is great. Uh, we want them to copy, like for, from our token economics model, we want people to copy as much as they can. Yeah, and and one thing that you haven't mentioned here in terms of the model, right, is that Binance, the company, right, Binance the company makes profits, and those profits, first of all, are like unrelated to the token. Although I guess some of them are that you directly re earn revenues in the token because people pay less fees if they pay the fees in the token, and then every quarter you spend twenty percent of the profits in buying the Binance token and destroying it. I think that's also a very interesting model, right? Because it's almost like a dividend, uh, at least economically. Uh, of course, it doesn't have the downside of, of a dividend, which is a dividend is probably like taxable income for the recipients, whereas this would be a capital gain thing more. Uh, and and so, yeah, and, and of course, it directly ties the value of the token to the success of the company, which is clearly very powerful. So yeah, I think the token economics make make a lot of sense of, of what you've created. Yeah, so actually a lot of people didn't understand the burning part. Um, so uh, well, that's a very interesting aspect of it because uh, the advanced people, the advanced users or the, block, the, uh, the savvier uh, investors understand it right away, but there's so much misconception around it. The um, burn. So every quarter we use twenty percent of our profits, uh, uh, and we burn that equivalent value in uh, in Binance coins. So, um, as you said, that removes a lot of the problems like the taxation, uh, the distribution mechanism. We have to pay network fees, transaction fees. So when we destroy a portion of it, that uh, financially it should be identical to distributing that dividend to other people. Um, um, but then we are. Um, mechanically, it's not a dividend. So um, uh, we are, we, we of course are always free to destroy our own coins. Anybody can destroy their own coin if they if they wish to. Uh, when you destroy it, your total supply goes down, and the Binance coin still have to represent the value it was you was representing before. So uh, this is the exact opposite when you print more money, right? So when you do quantitative easing, you're literally basically taking money away from everybody's people's every every person's bank account. Uh, and if you did that, people will complain. But when you print more money, people don't complain for whatever, for whatever reason, which I kind of don't understand. Yeah, so that's kind of our mechanism to do uh, to 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 spread the benefits of our profits to the to the to the user, but without actually doing any do, without doing a, the actual sending of money, we just burn what we have, and that works out quite well. Uh, so. I'm surprised not more people have, have copied that model. Many people copy the buyback, but they don't burn, which is kind of cheating. So, but th to me, this raises an interesting question. So, presumably, like you have your company and that has shareholders, and then you have the token, and then there are token holders. And ultimately, in your model, it's like if one dollar is is coming into your company as profit. Uh, this dollar must now be split into two communities, the token holders and the shareholders, right? So like 20% right now goes to the token holders and like presumably 80% goes to the shareholders, but in reality for the shareholders is reinvested and things like that. So now you have basically like these two communities and their interests might not always be the same. So doesn't this model like 
create the basis, the fault line for a future conflict between these two communities? There's two points here I kind of want to touch up on. Uh, one is the uh, shareholder versus coin holder uh, uh, situation. So um, uh, the coin holders hold the coins and we use our, the profits going to the company and we use 20% of it to burn and we, we basically destroy that, which benefits the coin holders in an indirect way, but very financially uh, 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 applicable, right? Um, but for the shareholders, they retain the other 80%. Uh, we retain the other 80% in the company, and um, we either reinvest into the company development or, or at a later stage, we may actually do a dividend uh, uh, payout, so which the shareholders will get uh, directly. And um, also the shareholders get a few different things. For example, Binance is a company, and um, if, we, if the company valuation goes up, the shareholders are benefited. The coin holders, they hold the coins. If the coin value rises up, uh, so, there, there, so there's a couple of different dynamics, right? So basically, for example, if the platform is doing well, and one of the key metrics of doing well is the um, uh, number of users. So let's say the number of users increase quite a bit. Um, so now uh, the, uh, the trading commissions that's, that's, that has to be spent on, uh, that has to be spent, uh, on the platform increases which increases the utility value of the Binance coin. The Binance coin price will go up. When the Binance coin price goes up, um, the, uh, the amount of coins that the team holds uh, will go up. So the value to the, it increases the value to the company. For the shareholders, the platform value also goes up. So uh, uh, there's, another, uh, there's another benefit to that. So there are different dynamics at play, uh, but the shareholders don't have the liquidity of the coin holders. So the, the shareholders, they, uh, because we're a private company and uh, uh, they, they don't have that kind of liquidity, whereas the coin holders, they can, they can choose to sell their coins at, at any time on our exchange. So uh, there's some interesting dynamics people still don't really quite understand. And to be honest, I think we're still in early stages in this, in this type of structure. Um, the, in terms of balancing the uh, uh, benefits, I think that's a very simple thing. Um, uh, we we very clearly promised what, what the benefits of the Binance coins are, and we, we honor that very strictly. So we got, we, we got to make sure that we honor that and usually probably a bit more. Uh, so we give incentives to our coin holders very often. The basic part of it is uh, obligation, right? So we make a promise, we got to keep it. That's just integrity, credibility. Um, that's very, very important. And then we all we over time we uh, do other stuff to do to to sort of help our community grow. That's you can consider that as marketing dollars or uh, helping the community, however you call it, in, including the the amount of money that we said we're going to cover the differences for the ICO returns, the six million dollars. So that's a decision that as a company we uh, as, as a company operation we will make as an operation team. So how we spend our company money, which affects our shareholder interests. But that's a very common, typical. That's like that exists in any company uh, that doesn't do an ICO. So for me, the 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 the, the separations are very clear, and the uh, different aspects of the uh, balancing the, uh, the 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 benefits of the of the two parties are very easy to do. Um, so that's just in our structure. In other structures, it may be a little bit different. So we'll see. Maybe maybe I can explain a situation and. And see how you would uh, how you would decide. So, so in 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 any balance sheet, right? In the in any account statement. So there's the account statement, the balance sheet, and the, there's the cash flow statement. So that's true for your company. Now let's say it's the year 2020, and you're making your account statement. So it's it's early on in the year, and and you're deciding uh, uh, you're making decisions that are going to impact the account statement for 2020. Now how much you are going to spend for research and development can determine what ends up as profit so let's say let's say you make a revenue of uh, right now it's 800 million dollars in revenue so let's say you make a revenue of 2 billion dollars and whether you decide to spend 200 million in r and d or 500 million in r and d is going to determine what gets left as profit and and then whatever gets left as profit, 20% of that goes to the coin holders, right? So in, in some senses, like you as CEO have 
have decision making capability on r&d uh, that is going to determine how much actually goes to the coin holders now the shareholders obviously want you to do more in r&d because that might create a a future product unrelated to the coin holder so let's say let's say you have a different product idea that is not related to the coin holders at all but that will benefit the shareholders so the shareholders want you to do more r&d but the coin holders rationally want you to do less r&d because that is greater profits so i think in that kind of situation um what you described there is a very short term vision for the short coin holders so, well, I think there's two things, right? So we should not be, uh, if we're spending the, uh, if we're spending our profits on some other product unrelated to our coin, uh, and so that, in, that benefits our shareholders later, and that does not benefit our coin holders, that's not good. So that's just uh, unethical in my, in, in my opinion. So that's why you will see that we actually have included many other uh, businesses uh, in Binance, and all of them have uh, used Binance Coin. So we did not do another ICO. We did not do. Uh, so we we actually have a media platform. We have an ICO platform. We have a. So we so all of our new businesses are are directly tied to uh, Binance Coin. So, um, so I think basically you should you should not use the prop. We should not use our profits from uh, uh, from our exchange to do some other unrelated business that does not benefit our platform uh, or basically our uh, coin uh, our coin holders what you the second thing you describe is the coin holders just want the price to go up without any without us doing any r d work that doesn't really make sense because uh, if we don't invest in our product if we don't if we don't make new features we if we don't uh, keep our products competitive and if we don't innovate over the long run the coin price will drop right so basically for, let's say we just keep that platform. We do. Uh, if we go to one extreme, you'll be quite easy to understand. Let's say that we do no R and D. That's not good for the coin holders. So let's say we fire all of our developers, and so now we can save. We can save costs. So now our profits will go up. Uh, but guess what? We will not be competitive. So Binance Binance.com will stay exactly the same. We'll just keep the operation team, and hoping that uh, this way you will you will give us the highest profit for this quarter. But guess what happens next quarter? Our competitors are going to continue to improve and everybody's going to go to them. And let's say we, we say, okay, no, we want the maximum profits, so we don't want to reinvest and we still don't hire developers. Over like uh, a couple months later, nobody will be using our platform. Guess what's going to happen to the coin price? It will drop to zero. So I think in that, in that so in what you describe is just a long-term versus short-term gain. And that applies equally to coin holders and shareholders. I think both of them wants the platform to be bigger, but wants the platform to have more users or more valuable. When the platform does that, both the coin price will go up and the shareholder value will go up. So I think that this from in, in, in the current situation for Binance, I don't I don't I don't see we have that problem at all. So um, so that's kind of my view on uh, uh, on that issue. That makes sense. Now we talked a lot already about Binance. Now let's move a little bit to some general topics. Now in particular, one that's very interesting is the topic of regulations. So you started in China, right? So regulations even in early on shaped the company, right? In that it, it kind of shut down your customers and then you decided to, to start Binance. So can you, can you just run us through like what are the different ways that regulation has kind of shaped the course uh, of fina uh, Binance? Up to this point, sure. I think um, um, different regulations uh, affect us different ways. Uh, basically, we have always adopted a stance where we will not go against any government. Uh, we will not go against any regulation. We will always be operating legally in any country, any jurisdiction. So, if a country does, if a country's regulation are shaping so that it does either does not allow cryptocurrency businesses or exchanges. Um, we will simply move. We will move to a different country. So, um, and we want. We are looking for countries that have favorable regulations. Um, interestingly, some of the negative regulations actually helped us <laughs> a few times. So, um, when when the Chinese re regulation said no more exchanges in China, they shut down all the exchanges in China. We luckily moved out uh, right before that. 
Um, and that was a very lucky decision, to be honest. Um, and um, when, when we stayed alive, actually a lot of users came to our platform and that helped uh, us uh, boost our initial, initial user base. And then recently this year, we are seeing a lot more countries who are realizing that favorable regulations towards the blockchain industry would encourage economic development. And now this year, we're seeing a lot more favorable regulations coming out. So now uh, uh, exchanges are le they're, they're legal exchange licenses in many, in many countries now, uh, including the US, uh, including many other including Malta, including Bermuda, including uh, hopefully soon Taiwan. So now we have, more, we, have, we have a lot more choices to go, uh, including like Africa, Uganda, right? So um, uh, the regulatory space is actually very, very important, but I think uh, we, have gone, we, have, we have gone past the point where uh, all countries re view blockchain or crypto as negative. I think now a lot of countries realize that this is positive. So now I, I believe we will see more adoption of, uh, uh, we'll see more regulatory adoption and more positive regulatory changes in this space, which is gonna be extremely beneficial for Binance. So uh, for Binance, we are looking for countries who have, uh, we're always on the lookout for countries who are extremely positive towards blockchain. Uh, so Malta is extremely pro positive. I think Bermuda will become very positive very very soon as well. So um, yeah, so uh, I think, uh, before there was always a risk factor to us, like people kind of worry about uh, regulations killing this industry, but I think that worry can be pretty much, uh, uh, that, more, that worry is gone. Uh, right now, the, it's just a matter of speed, how fast each country adopts blockchain regulations that are favorable. And I think that's, there's gonna be a lot of competition among different jurisdictions. So I think which will be very good for us. So, I certainly agree with you, right? That a lot of different countries will see this as an opportunity, right? To attract business. And, and so that we will not have that, like, you know, the whole world and all the countries say no. But if you look at the U.S., where there's been a lot of attention around regulation, right? The, the U.S. sound of interpretation tends to be very broad. And now if, you know, they say like, okay, let's say somebody has U.S. customers, you know, U.S. regulations apply to them. And particularly with the SEC, there seems to be clearly the trend that they will treat many, if not, you know, the vast majority of token sales as, you know, securities and, you know, maybe down the line tokens can become, you know, non-securities and tradable, but, you know, of course, securities means, you know, accredited investors, registration, all kinds of stuff like that. So I'm curious, like, how do you, how do you deal with that Binance, both regarding Binance token but also regarding many of the tokens that will be traded on the platform, you know, to have that risk of, you know, potentially being classified as a security. And then of course, potentially having a, a regulatory risk towards Binance, the company. Sure. So, um, for, uh, the security aspect of it, we take a very simple approach. We just ask uh, projects teams to supply a legal opinion, uh, stating that they are not a security. So we leave we, we leave that legwork to the to, to their lawyers. So they need to find a lawyer um, in whatever jurisdiction they are uh, uh, they are operating or they, they their teams are operating, and they basically gotta uh, have the legal opinion that they they're not a security. Uh, even that can sometimes have issues because, um, uh, for example, if they if if the lawyer is in one uh, one location and um, sometimes uh, a different jurisdiction, different location may not honor that that lawyer's opinion. And then we will ask the project team to say, hey, look, uh, can you get a second lawyer's opinion if, if needed? So that have happened so far, uh, that have happened. So, but that's a relatively easier problem for us to solve. Um, the, your previous point about uh, basically, um, for example, uh, uh, a lot of the regulations right now today uh, are overly strict. And overly complex. I think what people don't what people don't realize just yet is you can't just copy the existing regulations into crypto. That approach is almost guaranteed to not work well. So it's a very simple analogy to it. You don't want to copy how you run a postal office into how you run an email uh, a web or an email server, right? So those are two different businesses. You can't just move one. Um, uh, set of management practices in, uh, onto the next one. So you can't manage internet business the same way as you manage a traditional, say, factory. Um, so, but I think the uh, different reg and different regulators are now slowly 
understanding this. So I, I personally believe that um, the regulations have to adopt, or, or the regulators or the re regulatory approach have to adopt to a new industry. So you can't just take the old one onto the new one. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are different forces at play. Of course, uh, a lot of the regulatory bodies or the, regula the regulators, they, uh, a lot of them may want to retain their power, their influence, Etc. So uh, there will be some missteps in this on, uh, in this uh, endeavor. Not everybody is going to be making perfect decisions every time. But that's but I think enough people will make good decisions. Uh, the in the, and the competition will keep the industry going. So that's just how evolution works. So I'm pretty confident at this point, basically. What specifically attracted you to Malta? Initially, it was a uh, it was it was one of our users or friends who, who recommended me to go to Malta and meet with a bunch of very uh, relatively senior people. So I went there, um, uh, but after going there, it becomes very, very clear. Um, Malta uh, understands the importance of uh, leading the next fintech revolution. So they understand, so Malta has traditionally been a financial uh, hub. Uh, they were very forward in terms of uh, multiple financial regulations, uh, including the gaming, uh, online gaming industry. Uh, which uh, uh, in, including the online poker gambling industry as well. So they kind of understand this type of industries. And, uh, and this traditional, uh, traditional finance industries have been a little bit of a decline recently around the world. And they kind of felt that, that, felt that as well. And as a relatively small country uh, with limited natural resources, uh, they kind of, they understand they need to, uh, they need to leverage their own management uh, leadership uh, or basically management of the country, management of this uh, reg, uh, 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 of the industries well to be to be able to compete. So they understand this mentality. They have this mentality. That they need to service the industry. So when I went there, it was it was very clear from the prime minister down to the uh, current party in, in power to the opposition party, every uh, from uh, to the ministry of finance to the parliament secretary. Everyone wants to make this work. Everyone, everyone knows the importance of um, properly, healthily grow this blockchain industry. So, they, so when I went there, uh, different to many other countries, there was zero education that I have to do. Like, I don't have to tell them uh, why, what is a blockchain, how, how, how transactions work, what is a token. They understood all of this. And more, they know that this is important. They know this is good. So it was, quite, it was, a, very, it was a very easy conversation. And uh, after going there and seeing the uh, uh, the uh, proposed bill that they had in place, after reading that, um, all the all the comments that we, I had to give them was to you got to make this place a little bit stricter. You can't be too loose here. So they were overly easy actually on the uh, regulation. So it was it was quite an easy um, it was quite an easy decision afterwards. Very interesting. So uh, actually, like. Uh... This is the interesting piece that uh, now with, with Binance, I, I hope Binance succeeds an order of magnitude bigger. And and we actually have, uh, you know, like a multi-billion unicorn company that came out of an ICO. And so, you know, like, because like these things will also set examples for for the future, right? So from that sense, also, I think, as time progresses and successes like Binance emerges, uh, maybe the value proposition is easier to communicate to re regulators as as well. Uh, one of the one of the final topics we'd like to get into on this show is uh, the topic of decentralized exchange and uh, Binance's plans uh, up therein. So, like many people think that in the medium to long term, at least in the crypto to crypto space exchanges between users will be decentralized rather than centralized as they are today. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on this topic and where the future lies for crypto to crypto exchanges? Uh, sure. So uh, just back on, back on your first point uh, a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I'm very honored to, we, to, be, to have Binance be the example people look and follow uh, and learn. Uh, uh, so that, that's a really good thing. So we're very happy for that to happen. And I really want to see more and more unicorns uh, going through this model. And I think we will see that very, very soon. Uh, I think we're going to see many unicorns going through the ICO model, which may or may not be blockchain-based projects. Uh, but uh, the more startups, the more unicorns they are, the more the 
the more quicker our overall economic uh, or technology advancements are. So I'm very hopeful to that. Uh, in terms of uh, decentralized exchanges, um, I think both centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges will exist for quite a while. Um, I think decentralized exchanges in concept is quite good, but in uh, in uh, in practice or in in real life, uh, there are some shortcomings in terms of technology, what the cap technology capabilities are, and it will take a while for them to uh, fully eliminate centralized exchanges. So for Binance, we we are doing both, um, but of course we do the centralized one first. So uh, many so conceptually, decentralized exchange have many benefits. Um, uh, the exchange does not have to hold custody of the user's funds. Uh, the user can stay anonymous. Um, uh, the chain uh, everything happens on the blockchain, so there's no regulation. Uh, or there's very there there'll be little uh, regulation. So it's more it's it's freer. It's, there's higher degrees of freedom. Uh, but in reality, um, the current uh, when you have a blockchain, that means there's a network computers that need to synchronize with each other. Uh, that itself, by default, will be slower than a single computer making a decision, save save the results, and you're done. So uh, for the foreseeable future, the centralized exchanges will always be faster. And also from a competitive point of view, um, say if we want to do a decentralized Uber, right? So uh, technically it can be done. I think well, conceptually it can be done. But guess what? If we have a centralized Uber right now, if the decentralized one is kind of gaining momentum, the, the centralized one could say, we're going to run a campaign. We're going to rebate $10 to, for, every ride, for every ride you take. Um, and the decentralized one is going to be kind of hard to do that. So you, you, with a decentralized organization, you have to really plan ahead on how your ecosystem works. And you can't do this short-term quick adjustments on um, marketing campaigns, uh, free gifts, and a lot, a lot of this stuff. So technology-wise, until the decentralized exchange become fast enough, they will not have the uh, liquidity that the centralized exchanges do. And liquidity matters a lot when you trade. Uh, a high liquidity exchange where there's very deep books, um, you, when you, can, you can buy and sell very large quantities without moving the price, and which will basically save you a lot of money. So for the short term, centralized exchanges will be there, and they will serve different purposes. Um, over the long over the long run, I think eventually, uh, decentralized exchange probably will become the uh, norm when the technology gets better. So, uh, and um, we're very, we're very happy for that to happen, and we are making our own decentralized exchanges. So we have multiple implementations of our decentralized exchange, and we are we are actually promoting other decentralized exchange impl implementations as well. So we want others to try to disrupt us. And at the same time, we're trying to disrupt ourselves. So we'll see how that goes. But I think that's going to take a few years. So this actually does kind of tie into uh, something I, I wanted to ask about before, but then then didn't, didn't get to. So you mentioned, OK, let's say you had a decentralized Uber. Then some of the decision making, let's say marketing spend, you know, gets maybe more complex. And of course, there is the idea of having you know, decentralized autonomous organization, basic entire organizations where then coin holders can, uh, you know, participate in the decision making. And do you think in the long run, actually Binance as a company will also move towards a more decentralized model so that, you know, maybe it could be fully decentralized? Uh, yes, absolutely. We are trying um, uh, very seriously to turn Binance in, from a company into a community. So, um, I, but I think the transition will take some time. Um, so we first uh, turn into from a pure company into like uh, distributed teams, uh, distributed people are working around the globe on Binance. The second step would be, uh, let's say we, uh, we would want our Binance chain, they did our decentralized exchange implementation to be live first. Um, in the earlier in the earlier versions of that, some of the decision makings or um, a governance of the development may still be lie very heavily with the core team. But over time, we actually want to shift a lot of the governance out towards the, to the community. Um, so even today, even in our centralized exchange, we rely on a very large number of volunteers, what we call the Binance Angels, to sort of run our um, com uh, to run our community and our ecosystem. Really, so. Uh, we are we are exploring multiple ways, both in the centralized and decentralized models, to be more decentralized, to be more community-based. 
So I think that's going to be a theme we will continue to push. And uh, in my in my mind, I'm really hoping five uh, five or ten years later, um, it will be a fully decentralized thing where hopefully I don't have to do anything. <laughs> I just hold my coins and um, do uh, video interviews here and there, and the the whole thing runs itself. I'll be very happy. So that's kind of the ultimate goal. So, like you mentioned that Binance might disrupt itself, right? Like you might like invest on decentralized exchanges and build some of your own. Do you have any thoughts on what uh, the design for your decentralized exchange would look like? Sure. So for um, so we encourage almost every kind of decentralized exchange, and we list them. Uh, we give we help them get liquidity. Uh, we promote them. But for the Binance chain, um, my philosophy is quite simple. Uh, we want to do a chain that issues tokens and uh, trades tokens. So uh, those are the two main features we want to do. Um, so, uh, so from my perspective, I think that's uh, that's very important. Um, uh, so uh, our chain will not have a lot of complicated or uh, advanced features. Like um, a lot of these other chains have, like really strong smart contracts, different um, meta meta platforms, uh, side chains. They have all this. Uh, they have all this bell, uh, bells and whistles. I think the Binance chain will be more focused on the actual exchange feature. So we want to be able to trade one token against another, uh, but we want to focus more on performance and speed. Uh, it is my belief that uh, for an exchange, uh, performance is mo probably more, more important than features. I mean, today, even if you look at Binance exchange, we actually have less features than some of the other exchange platforms, uh, but we are fast and people like the fast, faster aspects of it. So that's kind of uh, you know not you know very at a very high level the the design decisions that's driving our chain design. Okay, so you you actually see the a Binance chain then also functioning as kind of an ICO chain where you can issue tokens you know maybe a little bit like an Ethereum you have a ERC twenty standard which has been very powerful in in issuing tokens and doing ICOs. So if if you could do that on the Binance chain and I know you guys have done some work in helping people do ICOs then uh, you can issue them on there and trade them straight away. So th th that's exactly the idea. So with Ethereum, you can do a lot more other stuff. Uh, the smart contract solidity, you can do a lot of other stuff. So our, our aim is more of, a, more of a specialized chain where it's issue tokens and trade tokens. And uh, so we will not have all the bells and whistles of Ethereum, but we, want, we probably want our blockchain to be faster in terms of uh, uh, at a higher capacity in terms of processing capability. Cool. Well, this is fascinating. So let's let's do one last thing, uh, one last question, kind of before we wrap up. So, what what are your thoughts on on the kind of crypto markets? Like, where do you see things going in the next year? Do you think we're going to see a lot of uh, growth, or how is regulation going to affect this? Like, what what are your kind of expectations for how the space will evolve? Sure. So, I think in terms of regulations, as as I said just a little bit earlier. Um, I think we'll see more and more countries adopting more and more favorable regulations and more and more and more uh, smarter regulations or more fit regulations for the for the blockchain industry. So I think this will be extremely positive for the uh, entire industry development and progress. Um, from a uh, eco from the ecosystem side, I think we will see a lot more coins. Uh, so I think more and more projects are going to, uh, like a lot more projects are going to use ICOs to raise money than uh, traditional VC routes. So as a result of that, we're going to see a lot more coins. With a lot more coins, we're going to need exchanges to provide liquidity to all of these coins or change between the coins. Um, so I think exchanges will continue to provide a very important role. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more exchanges as well. Um, and the other thing that's uh, in the in terms of the uh, ecosystem, we need we need to see a lot more wallets. Um, uh, right now, uh, I think there's still a lot of improvements or uh, uh, room for improvement in the wallet space. We need different type of wallets: hardware, software, more secure, industrial wallets that can handle millions of addresses, uh, millions of transactions in one installation. So, uh, so we uh, so that that aspect of it, I think that we will see a lot more wallets. Um, I think mining is probably mining is an industry I kind of understand, but don't really know them in detail. And it's a very big, very important industry. So I think uh, people things will continue to happen there, but I'm not an expert. Um, 
we we should see a lot more payment gateways, a lot more merchants, a lot more merchant adoption. So um, I think in all of these areas, we will see a lot more growth. Um, I think basically the current exchanges are going to get probably a hundred to a thousand times bigger over the next few years. So that and and, and as a uh, and I think that's mainly going to be as a result of the industry getting a hundred a thousand times bigger. And when the industry does that. Uh, the coin price is probably going to do similar things. So I don't, I don't really want to make any like sort of hard predictions on where the coin price is going to be, but I think we have a lot of room to grow. Cool, fantastic. Well, thanks so much for coming on. That was an absolutely fascinating, interesting conversation and loved learning more about Binance and what you've built there. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure. So, of course, we're going to have uh, show notes, so links to Binance and, and some of the resources around Binance if people want to learn more or use the platform and trade on that. So there will be lots to, to check out. And uh, thanks so much to our listener for once again tuning in. So we put out new episodes of Epicenter every week. You can subscribe uh, to the show on iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, your favorite podcast app, or watch the videos on youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. And yeah, if you want to support the show, you can leave us an iTunes review. And otherwise, thanks so much. We look forward to being back next week.